بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Understand that Iblis has vowed to lead you astray and what greater misguidance is there than to wander from the straight path Iblis seeks to emulate Allah in every conceivable way He has set his throne upon water a vain mimicry of Allah's throne and he commands a legion of demons organizing them into hierarchies that imitate the order of the angels moreover he aims to divert humankind through acts of worship misplaced upon him whether through prostration reverence or praise satan desires recognition so desperately that any mention of his name swells him with pride his influence in the modern world is marked by luring humanity into the sin of shirk and its manifestations the symbols of his treachery can be found throughout the world a signature of his wretched work you only need in to look a little closer abu al mali reported a man said i was riding on a mount behind the prophet peace be upon him and it stumbled so i said may satan perish the prophet peace and blessings be upon him said do not say may satan perish if you say that he will swell with pride until he becomes as big as a house and he says by my might rather you should say in the name of allah if you say that he will shrink until he becomes as small as a fly our story begins in the ancient city of babylon the people there began indulging in sorcery and magic seeking supernatural powers and engaging in forbidden practices allah sent two angels harut and marut as a trial to differentiate between those who believe and those who engage in disbelief by practicing sorcery and to show the people the difference between magic and the miracle from allah performed by the prophets Harut and Marut warned the people that they were a test from Allah and advised them to not engage in sorcery. We are a test for you. Do not fall into disbelief, they cautioned. However, despite the warnings, some people persisted in their practice of magic, thereby failing the test. A Su'di narrates that when a man would come to the two angels, they would caution him not to succumb to disbelief as they were a test. Yet if a person dismissed their advice, the angels would instruct him to urinate on a pile of ashes in this act of defiance as the man followed through it was said that the very essence of his faith symbolized by a shining light would leave him soaring upwards until it entered heaven in its place a darkness like smoke would descend upon him entering his ears and the rest of his body this was the manifestation of allah's displeasure if the man then recounted his experience to the angels they would teach him magic This report resonates with the hadith which warns that acts of injustice will be revealed as darkness on the day of rising. And what else could be the greatest injustice except for shirk? As we find Luqman advising his son, "Oh my son, do not associate partners with Allah. Indeed, such an act, shirk, is the greatest injustice." It is said that the devils would eavesdrop on the conversations of angels in heaven. gathering information about events on earth and conveying it to the soothsayers these soothsayers trusted by the people relayed what they believed to be true however the devils began adding lies to the information they provided deceiving the soothsayers and the people this deception led to the widespread belief that the jinn knew the unseen and this information was recorded by many people and the practice of magic or occultism spread across the known world encompassing various forms of magic and supernatural beliefs it encompassed rituals invoking supernatural entities the use of charms amulets inscription magic and other practices while the core principles remained constant the practice evolved based on cultural adaptations these occult traditions traversed through ancient civilizations such as mesopotamia the early mesopotamians used an amulet to bind the demon Lamashtu which bore an Akkadian inscription in cuneiform script encircling its central plane amulets depicting the demon Pazuzu 
were also used by the Mesopotamians to protect against threats from other demons. Egypt In ancient Egypt, people made amulytic wands from ivory and bones as ritual offerings to their false gods. They often inscribed on these wands images, hieroglyphs, of their false deities, such as the Wajet Eye, the Eye of Horus, which they believed could protect them. The Wajet Eye was also used in making amulets. Another important symbol used in talismans and amulets was the Ankh, which represented life and was used for protection, well-being, and longevity, kind of like a peculiar symbol we have today. Greece Ancient Egyptian magic eventually mixed with Greek practice, which led to a fusion of Greco-Egyptian script. The Greek magical papyri uses an Ouroboros symbol with magical words in Greek, with non-Semitic characters in the center of this protection amulet. The Romans had fused many aspects of the Greek and Egyptian religion, art, and magic. This was an amulet worn for a specific purpose, invoking a false deity written in Coptic, an Egyptian language that uses Greek alphabets. Interestingly, this resembled a common symbol in the New Kingdom of Egypt. The owls were commonly used as amulets, meant to help the owner in the underworld. In modern times, we can see the return of this false idol in a particular fashion brand, and this owl idol is also erected in the infamous Bohemian Grove. Scholars refer to a collection of ancient texts originating from Greco-Roman Egyptian as the Greek Magical Papyri. These documents, primarily penned in Ancient Greek and Old Coptic, comprise of various magical incantations, formulas, hymns, and rituals. This Roman amulet unearthed in Cyprus invokes both false Egyptian deities and a false Yahweh. Notice, now the inscriptions had evolved to a more of a pictorial structure. Keep this in mind as we will revisit this later. A pattern begins to emerge as we can observe each culture adding its own nuances to the magical inscriptions. Over time, these inscriptions and symbols are integrated into different cultures of the known world. For example, the Babylonian alphabets are utilized to form pictorial structures. The use of an ankh or a cross symbol along with a ringlet on the top would be used as a symbolic inscription. The Eye of Horus would also be mixed into the inscriptions alongside magical words containing debased Babylonian, Hebrew, Egyptian, Coptic, and Greek words forming the foundation of the modern inscription magic, known as sigils. In the synchronistic world of magic, many of these symbols would be imported into Jewish, Christian, Arab, and other cultures as well, upholding the overall essence of shirk as they sought assistance from an entity, the jinn, which they deified and invoked in hopes of earning their favor in return for acknowledgement, worship, or sacrifice. The children of Israel were no exception in learning this forbidden practice. They learned magic and wrote manuscripts which may have detailed rituals instructing the crafting of amulets, incantation spells, and creating talismans with inscribed enchantments invoking the devils. For some of them started to believe that the devils knew the unseen. Moreover, during their enslavement, the Israelites had witnessed the power of magic which was practiced by the Egyptians. On the other hand, the magicians engaged in this magic witnessed a miracle from Allah during their showdown with Musa alayhi salam. They realized that what they encountered was a true miracle from Allah and not the trickery magic they were practicing. Overwhelmed, the magicians prostrated themselves and declared their belief in Allah. During the reign of Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam, he discovered that his people were engaging in these practices of magic. In response, Sulaiman gathered all the magical manuscripts, securing them in a box, which he then buried beneath his throne. He established a strict decree whereby any attempts made by the devils to approach the box would result in their incineration. Sulaiman declared a stringent stance against the claims that the devils possess knowledge of the unseen threatening execution to those who asserted such beliefs, he decreed the death penalty for anyone found learning, practicing, or teaching magic, seizing the manuscripts from both devils and humans alike. 
After Suleiman's passing, and as generations passed, knowledge of his true teachings faded. In the following era, the devil disguised himself as a human and approached some from the children of Israel, promising to reveal an inexhaustible treasure hidden beneath Suleiman's throne. Skeptical, yet intrigued, they agreed, and upon discovering the manuscripts, were misled by the devil into believing that Suleiman's kingdom and dominion over humans, devils, and birds was derived from magic through the use of the jinn. This misconception led to the widespread adoption of what became known as Solomonic magic. But Suleiman did not disbelieve. Rather, this was a grave deception the devil played and it maliciously worked. The unearthed manuscripts were taken by the people, who then proceeded to practice the magic inscribed within them once again. Over time, this disobedience in God's commands and deviation from the righteous path led to idol worship. For you see, the practicing of magic and idol worship share a strong correlation. Some time after, a number of the inhabitants of Judah started worshipping Baal. They were led astray by the devil into worshipping an idol sculpted from stone, sacrificing innocent children for the blessing of rain, a misdirection that would eventually lead to their punishment. King Nebuchadnezzar II would soon invade Jerusalem, and following the destruction of the Jewish kingdom by Nebuchadnezzar, the Jewish people faced enslavement and exile into Babylon, severely affecting their religious traditions. Secluded from their scriptures and influenced by Babylonian culture, Judaism underwent distortions. This period of exile saw the composition of the Talmud by 72 rabbis who integrated mystical and supernatural themes such as angels, demons, and the occult into their discussions. Within the Talmudic texts, particularly in the Agadic sections, there are references to mysticism, magic, and the occult including discussions on using an amulet for protection, and speak of a tetragrammaton, a symbol falsely connected with Suleiman salam. According to the rabbis, King Solomon employed a demon named Asmodeus, using a special ring presented to him by the archangel Gabriel. This ring inscribed with the tetragrammaton, or hexagon, allegedly granted Solomon access to hidden wisdom and magic, enabling him to harness the power of the Shamir worm for the construction of his temple without the use of metal tools by subduing Asmodeus into revealing the location of this worm. In another pseudopigraphal composition, it is mentioned that King Solomon bound Baalzebub, an elite-level demon, among the other demons. When the lesser demons witnessed this occurrence, they cried out and howled in distress as their king had been humiliated before them. The narrative also suggests that Baalzebub was the same demon who masqueraded as Baal. They say the greatest trick that the devil ever played was convincing the world he does not exist. But the devil is in the detail you don't discern. Remember Harut and Marut? It is possible that they were falsely deified as well over time as Marut became Amarutu in ancient Babylon by the Shayateen Amarutu was revered as the false god of storms and rainfall, essentially for vegetation. He was often represented by a bull calf. Among the Akkadians, Haddad was the false deity of storm and rain, commonly depicted sporting a bull-horned headdress and symbolized as a bull. In Egypt, Hathar was worshipped as the false goddess of music, dance, flood, and fertility frequently illustrated in the form of a cow. In Canaanite tradition, Baal was the false deity of fertility, rain, and storms, and was typically portrayed as a bull. The Israelites were fooled by the same idol twice. It just took a different name the first time. During Moses' absence, when he ascended Mount Sinai, they created a calf idol, likely inspired by the Egyptian false deity Hathar the deity of fertility and dance. The second time, they once again venerated to a false calf idol known as Baal in hopes of receiving rain and fertility. And now, in the modern age, the sacrificing and burning of the cow's ritual is back as it was once performed by the ancestors of the Israelites many millennia ago. 
They believe by burning these red heifers, the dawning of the messianic age will come to fruition and ultimately lead them to their destiny as the chosen people, which is basically fertility and rain. A stark contrast to the Hadith, referring to the flourishing state of Jerusalem and the desolation of Yathrib being linked to the emergence of the Jaw. Interestingly, the earth will withhold rain before the emergence of the Jaw, which is essentially what Baal was venerated to bring forth. Part of the Jaw's fitna will be that he will command the sky to rain, and it will rain, and he will command the earth to bring forth vegetation. So are the children of Israel venerating to the shaitan once again, disguised as something divine? Different idols, similar persona. The devil is in the detail. The hexagon symbol falsely attributed to Solomon was itself a powerful symbol used today in the practice of magic and its branches, especially inscription magic. Jewish alchemists were the teachers of their Arab and Christian counterparts and influenced their practice of mysticism. However, despite these tales propagating the myth of Solomon as a sorcerer who used the symbol of a hexagon or Star of David, in truth, Solomon did not engage in disbelief as all power is with Allah alone. Jews of the Talmudic period, much like their non-Jewish counterparts, embraced and depended upon the efficacy of magic spells for personal protection. This dependence is shown by a form of magical amulets known as the incantation bowl. Often a yellowish colored bowl encircled with incantations from the rabbinic texts using the names of rabbis and angels with an image drawn in the center. This magical formula was used to drive away evil spirits and help in preserving and protecting individuals or a family, often with a particular concern for marital life or to achieve a specific desire. Interestingly, the origins of these bowls were pagan in practice. The formulas used within the magical bowls were used to invoke entities, both celestial or demonic, for various purposes including protection. The Jews of the Talmudic era took their rabbis and angels as their protectors by using their names to invoke protection, elevating their position before Allah and followed in the ways of the disbelievers through their actions, ultimately corrupting the faith. An intriguing ayat comes to mind and consider the day he will gather them all together and then ask the angels, was it you that these polytheists used to worship? They will say, exalted are you, you, O Allah, are our benefactor, not them. Rather, they used to worship the jinn. Most of them were believers in them. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was sent as the final prophet to convey God's message, the very people who believed in these occult practices refused the truth. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was well aware of the practice of magic and its many branches, from astrology to blowing on knots, stating whoever performs magic has committed idolatry, shirk, and affirmed that spells, charms, love potions are polytheism, and whoever hangs an amulet around his neck has committed idolatry, shirk. And when a messenger from Allah came to them, confirming that which was with them, the original revelation, a party of those who had been given the scripture threw the scripture of Allah behind their backs as if they did not know what it contained and they followed instead what the devils had recited during the reign of Solomon. It was not Solomon who disbelieved, but the devils disbelieved, teaching people magic and that which was revealed to the two angels at Babylon, Harut and Marut. But the two angels do not teach anyone unless they say, we are a trial, so do not disbelieve by practicing magic. And yet, they learned from them that by which they cause separation between a man and his wife. But they do not harm anyone through it except by permission of Allah. And the people learn what harms them and does not benefit them. But the children of Israel certainly knew that whoever purchased the magic would not have in the hereafter any share. And wretched is that for which they sold themselves, if they only knew. Here, even the Qur'an affirms that what the children of Israel were following at the time of Muhammad was what the devils had recited
during the reign of Sulaiman alayhi salam. It is reported from Ibn Mas'ud that once when he entered his home, he noticed his wife wearing a knotted object around her neck. He took it away and broke it. Then he remarked, the family of Abdullah have become so arrogant that now they associate with Allah those from whom he set down no authority. I have heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam saying, Verily, incantations, amulets, and love charms are acts of shirk associating gods with Allah. The people said, O Abu Abdullah, we are familiar with incantations and amulets, but what is a love charm? He replied, It is sort of a magical spell formula by which women sought to gain their husband's love. In that era, amulets were commonly worn as necklaces, often bearing inscriptions of the false deities such as Allat. Notice the similarities between the amuletic magic of the incantation balls and the love charms. Both contain a spell to achieve a desired outcome in marital affairs. Muhammad was sent by Allah as the final prophet bearing the message of Tawheed, ultimate justice, the truth that illuminated the world to eradicate the darkness of injustice and its forms, primarily shirk and its manifestations of falsehood on the earth. For Allah mentions in the Qur'an what Luqman advised his son by way of advice. O oh my son, do not associate partners with Allah. Indeed, such an act, shirk, is the greatest injustice. Tawheed is the belief that Allah is one without partner in His sovereignty, Rububiya, one without similitude in His essence and attributes, Asma wa Sifat, and one without rival in His divinity and in worship, Uluhiyya, Ibadah. There is none worthy of worship but Allah, and Muhammad wasallam is the last and final messenger of Allah. Shirk is defined as the act of associating partners with Allah in His Lordship, Rububiyyah, divinity or worship, Uluhiyyah, or names and attributes, Asma wa Sifat. Engaging in the practice of magic, teaching it, or using it for one's own benefit constitutes disbelief, especially after acquiring faith. Prophet Muhammad said, Whoever practices magic has committed shirk. This means that magic involves elements of associating partners with Allah as it requires worshipping the jinn and elevating their status to a position only worthy of Allah. For example, claiming knowledge of the future is an attribute only Allah possesses as He is Al-Alim, the All-Knowing. Moreover, magic cannot be practiced without seeking assistance from the jinn and seeking their favor through sacrifices, oaths, prostration, and other acts of worship. These practices involve using incantations, performing specific actions, and using images, idols, or objects. For these reasons, scholars have ruled that those who practice magic are considered disbelievers. You might believe that you don't associate with magic or its branches, nor do you partake in any form of idolatry or its various manifestations, but you will soon realize that things aren't always as they seem. Muhammad had warned the people of shirk and its forms, stating on one occasion to Abu Bakr that idolatry, shirk, is more hidden than the crawling of an ant. Abu Bakr asked, Is not idolatry or shirk restricted to ascribing partners to Allah? Rasulullah said, I take an oath in that being in whose control lies my soul. Shirk is more hidden than the crawling of an ant. In other narrations, it mentions Arriya, the hidden shirk, is more difficult than seeing a black ant on a black stone in a moonless night. Hence, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ recognized and destroyed magical inscriptions and symbols and other forms of shirk. Muhammad himself destroyed images and symbols of the cross, a blasphemous icon attributed to Isa salam. In war, Prophet Muhammad adopted a plain black standard without images, 
possibly to signify pure monotheism. For official correspondence, he used the seal, as letters of the time were only considered official if marked. The seal was inscribed with Muhammad Rasul Allah, Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ also removed this ring before entering the washroom as it bore the inscription Muhammad Rasul Allah. This act reflects the Quranic verse, and whoever honors the symbols of Allah, it is certainly out of the piety of the heart. In the tafsir, these symbols are interpreted as the Sharia of Allah, encompassing His commands including the performance of Salat, prayer, Hajj, pilgrimage, fasting, and other religious acts such as attending the mosque or making sacrificial offerings. Over the centuries, some from among the children of Israel delved deeper into the forbidden realm of magic, perfecting their practices and intertwining the shirki occult knowledge acquired from the shayateen with their religious doctrines. This unholy union spawned practices like Kabbalah and Gamatria, veiled under the guise of mystical arts. From this fear of influence, an anomaly began to take root. A group of occultists began compiling ancient manuscripts and started engaging in ritual magic that invoked the demons whom they attributed with Suleiman salam. The names of these demons were inscribed within an inscription and each demon was given a different symbol to be honored and so their malevolent legacy would remain through the ages. The previous inscription magic, including the incantation bowls, had now transformed into a variant of magic known as Segula magic, a protective or benevolent charm or ritual in Kabbalistic and Talmudic tradition. This eventually became known as Sigil magic in the modern age. Over time, manuscripts detailing the practices of demonic Sigil magic were handed down through successive generations. In the 17th century, a compodium of these manuscripts were published under the title the Lesser Key of Solomon, also referred to as the Lemegeton. Although attributed to King Solomon, this grimoire was actually a collection of texts from various ancient writings. The Ars Goetia, the most well-known section of the Lesser Key of Solomon, catalogs the names, descriptions, and sigils of the 72 demons purportedly summoned and bound by Solomon into a brass vessel secured with magical inscriptions. This part of the grimoire gave instructions for summoning these demons while ensuring the conjurer's protection within a magical circle, using sigils to represent each demons or shaitan. Notably, it included the sigil for Asmodeus, who some skeptics alleged Solomon controlled to command the lesser devils. The grimoire also lists the demon Baal, correlated with Baal, which is mentioned in the Quran. Similar sigils are documented in other texts such as the Munich Manual of Demonic Magic or Liber Incantatonium, which also discussed the use of symbols to represent false deities like Lilith, who was essentially an archetype of Allah. These entities have been interpreted differently over time and persist in the modern age, but they all lead back to the Shaitan. Now, here is where things get even more interesting. With the advent of the internet in the modern era, the practice of shirk and magic has undergone significant evolution, paralleling advancements in science, technology, and globalization. While traditional magical practices persist, their method of practice have transformed. New forms of magic have emerged, harnessing the power of the internet and employing mediums such as sound or vibrations, images, and inscriptions. These contemporary magical practices can be disseminated or performed through digital or electronic means exerting real-world influence or causing harm akin to traditional black magic. Remember the Quranic recitation video which had a hidden incantation embedded in the background audio or the multitude of websites offering tarot card readings or astrological and horoscope forecasts. Additionally, there's online spell magic employing digitalized charms and sigil magic known as emoji magic. The word emoji itself is analogous to the Sanskrit word omja, meaning born of cosmic unity. Emoji magic is essentially sigil charm magic, which is practiced in the modern day through the use of emojis, which have transformed the concept from the demon sigils found in the grimoire of the lesser keys of Solomon and other manuscripts. 
A sigil is basically a seal inscribed with an image or pictogram that represents specific energies or intentions and can encompass a desire, an archetype, or even an entity. All of these are fundamentally a call to the shayateen. Beyond just being signs or symbols, sigils encapsulate a particular purpose or intent. Sigils can be charged through a variety of different ways. The most popular are through spiritual, carnal, or emotional energy. In the 72 Lesser Keys of Solomon, there are 72 sigils for demons which the magicians associate with King Solomon. And these demons can be invoked and summoned for a specific desire you would like fulfilled. And these sigils can be found in amulets or talismans and have changed over time to be used in emoji magic. A charm is something that can be used to invoke feelings or emotions which magicians classify as attraction of specific energies or outcomes such as luck, both in the person using the charm and potentially in others who encounter it. The specific feeling invoked by a charm can vary widely depending on its purpose, symbolism, and the beliefs of the individual using it. So, how are emojis part of sigil magic from the 72 lesser keys of Solomon, you ask? Well, seeing is believing. If you're skeptical about the possibility of emojis being derived from the sigils in the lesser key of Solomon and other grimoires, take a closer look and see for yourself. Here is Osmodius as mentioned before, a leader of the Shayateen. Here is Baal or Baal, whose mention still echoes in the modern age. Here is Lilith, who is essentially an archetype of Allah, and here is Pazuzu, represented by this demon in our emojis. The sigils found in the Lesser Key of Solomon Grimoire are said to have evolved over generations, a common practice in the occult where inscriptions are adapted to fit the cultural context of that region. As a result, the sigils of demons in the Lesser Key of Solomon have been transformed and resemble many of the emojis prevalent in the modern world. Interestingly, most of us use these emojis without any knowledge of their origins. These sigils are concealed within the vast array of emojis akin to inscriptions within amulets or talismans. In a nutshell, emoji magic is the combination of a charm or charms drawn after a sigil, usually in the form of a face, and is charged through the emotions they evoke. The witches and warlocks who use this modern form of magic state that Emoji magic is not different than sigil magic. Emoji spells can contain layers of secret meaning. Young witches are using emojis to create unique visual spells they can cast with their phones and computers. What makes emoji magic very unique is that it is universal as humans can easily ascribe their emotions or energy to these smileys depicting emotion. The primary challenge with symbolic magic lay in its lack of universality. However, with the establishment of the Unicode Consortium, the magicians now have the opportunity to create a general standard for symbols and standardize sigils or charms as emojis globally. Symbols and images play crucial roles as focal points for a practitioner's intention and will aiding in concentrating and directing the mental and spiritual energies necessary for magical acts. These emojis can be imbued with power to represent cosmic forces, deities, or supernatural entities. Through the utilization of these symbols, practitioners seek to access and harness these forces more readily, facilitating the practice of magic, which is play with words, symbolic colors, a natural imagery to turn an intention into a magic image. The sigil. Emoji magic is the exact same thing as sigil magic. And when an emoji spell is liked or shared on social media, it gathers a charge. The more charges, the more powerful it can become. So what does this have to do with the believers? When utilizing emojis, we engage in three potential breaches. Number one. The first breach occurs when we use an emoji, as we are essentially crafting a soulless and unnecessary image that serves no genuine purpose beyond expressing one's emotions. In doing so, we infringe upon Tawheed Asma wa Sifat, the principle of maintaining the unity of Allah's names and attributes. 
Allah is Al Musawwir, the one who forms his creatures in different pictures, and by creating images, we essentially challenge this attribute of Allah. This notion is further emphasized in a hadith narrated by Muhammad sallallahu wherein Allah declares, Who are more unjust than those who attempt to create something like my creation? I challenge them to create even the smallest ant, a grain of wheat, or a grain of barley. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu warned against creating graven images, emphasizing that severe punishment awaits those who attempt to imitate Allah in the act of creation. He stated that every maker of graven images will face the torment of hellfire, with each image being given a soul to punish its creator in hell. You took my body, you took my life, and now it's time to pay! Ask yourself, will you be able to put soul into this unnecessary image on the day of judgment? Muhammad ordered the breaking of the idols, the leveling of the graves, and smearing of the images, and he addressed making graven images and statues as one of the two evils. Thus, such an act is a grave injustice, a form of shirk, and it is cautioned that if there is no meaningful purpose behind creating an image, then abstain from it altogether. The scholars have permitted the use of images in specific circumstances when it is deemed necessary citing evidence from the Qur'an. For instance, this video utilizes images and serves a legitimate purpose of conveying a crucial message. Its use of images is deemed permissible. أما عند السنة والأدلة التصوير بعمومه حرام وملعون المصور وهو أشد الناس عذاب يوم القيامة فما الذي يخرج الجوال من هذا الرسول حرم التصوير مطلقا بأي وسيلة جوال كاميرا باليد بالرسم حرمه تحريما مطلقا فمن يستثني على الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم يستدرك على الرسول إلا أن العلماء المحققين استثنوا حالة الضرورة إذا احتاج الإنسان للتصوير للضرورة فيباح هذا من أجل الضرورة قوله تعالى وقد فصل لكم ما حرم عليكم إلا ما اضطررتم إليه أما التصوير للهواية والتصوير للفن تصوير بالكاميرا أو باليد أو يعني شيء فهو حرام ولا يجوز إلا للضرورة فقط بقدر الضرورة رخصة رخصة من أجل الضرورة فقط نعم Some people may contest stating that it's merely a harmless image which transforms into data once your phone is switched off and it's certainly not an object of worship Allah's sovereignty and lordship extends even into the realms of the digital world. He is the lord of all the worlds, encompassing everything in our reality and beyond, including all the dimensions from the micro to the macro, the apparent and the hidden. Even the worlds we have imagined and tried to illustrate, Allah is the lord of these worlds. The believer upholds Tawheed by both affirmation Acknowledgement and affirming the oneness of Allah in His Lordship, Rububiyyah, Divinity, Uluhiyyah, Names, Asma, and Attributes, Sifat, and Negation, rejecting any form of association, partnership, or similarity with Allah in His Lordship, Divinity, Names, or Attributes. True Tawheed is realized only when it encompasses both these aspects. While you recognize that creating images is unjust, it's also necessary to actively reject the act of making them. Actions speak louder than words. A thought-provoking verse comes to mind. He who made for you the earth, a bed spread out, and the sky a ceiling, and sent down from the sky rain, and bought forth thereby fruits as provision for you. So do not attribute to Allah equals, while you know that there is nothing similar to Him. Allah can forgive everything on the Day of Judgment except for shirk. Consider the nature of these images. While one may have a malevolent appearance, the other seems harmless, akin to a cartoon, yet they depict the shayateen. Be wary of the subtleties of shirk. 
which can be beautified and hidden. This deception is an ancient trick of Iblis who beautifies the evils. Number 2. Avoid emulating the practices of the disbelievers in your actions, particularly in matters of social customs. Just because they engage in certain practices doesn't mean the believers need to follow suit. It was narrated from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri anhu that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, You will certainly follow in the ways of those who came before you, handspan by handspan, cubit by cubit, to the extent that if they entered the hole of a lizard, you will enter it too. We said, O Messenger of Allah, do you mean the Jews and the Christians? He said, Who else? Consider the emojis that have become commonplace in your daily interactions. If these same images were placed alongside the names of Allah, or verses from the Qur'an, or part of an Islamic text message promoting Tawheed, how would you feel about it? Suddenly, the emojis become displeasing and inappropriate, yet we utilize these very images on a day-to-day -day basis. This introspection begs the question, how do we differ from the Israelites, who during their exile incorporated the pagan Babylonian practices of using incantation bowls into their religion? The Israelites, like their Babylonian counterpart, began drawing images in the middle of a bowl with rabbinic inscriptions for a desired outcome or effect. One used images and religious writing as an amulet for protection and hid it under the earth. The other uses images and writing to convey emotions, often mixing shirki images with text from the Qur'an and Hadith as if it has a better outcome. Though we are not practicing magic, we are treading down the same path as the Israelites. If you were to ask the Israelites about their transgressions, they would justify their actions and say, we were not venerating to these angels or rabbis, and these images were necessary as the ritual required it, and these bowls were mere instruments of delivery. Yet the Torah explicitly prohibits such practices, stating, and be careful when you have had children and children's children, do not become complacent in the land and act corruptly by making an image or an idol in the form of anything, thus doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord and provoking him to anger. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. The commandments in the Bible is also clear for the Christians. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Yet they still persist in their jahili ways. Number 3. As previously mentioned, the symbols of Iblis' deceit are prevalent globally, serving as a distinct mark of his malevolent influence. Images have long been utilized by Iblis for acts of veneration, a conduit towards major shirk. In the world of magic, emojis represent a modern amalgamation of charms and sigils where a facial glyph emoji, usually reflective of a sigil, is charged through emotions or intentions, effectively making them modern counterparts to ancient hieroglyphics and inscription magic. As mentioned before, the emojis are also considered by some practitioners of magic as the current iteration of sigil-based magic. The emojis bear striking resemblance to the sigils found in the magical grimoires. When witches and warlocks use these emojis, particularly within magical contexts, they align themselves with symbols that traditionally hold a deeper malicious meaning. These emojis often encapsulate a specific feeling or intention, functioning similarly to charms. It's important to recognize that within the vast array of available emojis, some represent or resemble demonic entities, astrological and pagan symbols, amulets, and other shirki images as well. Subhanallah. Why are these symbols of kufr even there? Think about it. Sometimes, the use of charms is not due to false beliefs, but it is merely an imitation of the kuffar, which is also a very serious issue. Muslims are strictly prohibited from adopting any non-Islamic practice or imitating the non-Muslims, whether it be creed or certain actions. Even if you believe that your intentions is pure, ask yourself, is it absolutely necessary to send an image associated with something that is so unlawful? Allah's Messenger وسلم, has warned the Muslim Ummah in several hadith on different occasions against imitation of the kuffar. He وسلم, once said, whoever imitates a people, 
he is one of them. Reflect on the weighty actions of Muhammad وسلم, who erased images in the Kaaba with his blessed hands and the bucket of water, saying, May Allah fight those who create images of what they are not able to create. In contrast to the one who easily clicks to produce an image devoid of a soul. Do not forget the endeavors of the righteous men of the past who died upholding Tawheed. Sheikh Al Khattabi said, In fact, the punishment of a Musawwir, picture maker, is made severe because surahs, pictures, were worshipped besides Allah. Furthermore, looking at them may become a sort of fitna, temptation, and some souls might be attached to them. So, why is negating these unnecessary images so important? What implications come from such actions? Abu Huraira reported Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as stating that Allah the Most High and Exalted said, I am the one, one who does not stand in need of a partner. If anyone does anything in which he associates anyone else with me, I shall abandon him with one whom he associates with Allah. If we continue to tolerate shirk and its forms, how can we as an ummah expect help and victory from Allah? It is upon us to earnestly uphold Tawheed through affirmation and acknowledgement in the oneness of Allah in His Lordship, Divinity, Names and Attributes, and negation, rejecting any form of association, partnership or similarity with Allah in His Lordship, Divinity, and names and attributes. The dishonored condition of the Muslim Ummah is correlated with the unchecked presence of shirk and its manifestations which have sown itself within our homes in both the physical world and in the digital realm. Sheikh Al-Fawzan has addressed the pervasive nature of idols and the potential fitna through the modern media outlets and the internet. This digital fitna is forewarned in the hadith about the end of times, a trial inescapable by any Muslim's home. لا يبقى بيت من العرب إلا دخلت. هذه المشكلة فتنة عامة تدخل البيوت تدخل البيوت والله أعلم الله أعلم إن وسائل الإعلام الآن وسائل الإعلام و... وهذه الوسائل الانترنت وما أدري ويش تنقل هذه الشرور تدخلها على الناس ببيوتهم أنت ما رحت لها لكن هي جت دخلت عليك أنت على فراشك عندك ها ها الصنم اللي جنبك حركه ويجيب لك كل كل شرط وكل بلاء هذه فتنة نعم even though the Sheikh did not provide detailed explanations, he correctly identified that media channels and the internet are conduits through which the evils can spread. He warned that this idol which is next to you accompanies you constantly and has the potential to bring forth all manner of malevolence and destruction. This pertains to the needless images we discussed, including emojis and other unnecessary visuals, and their creation constitutes a great injustice which circulate widely in the digital world, from home to home taken as something casual by many Muslims today. Aside from creating unnecessary images in the digital world, all physical depictions, logos or figures resembling living creatures or even just the silhouettes should be destroyed and discarded or smeared and changed to resemble a non-living object. There are considerations that apply to children's toys, identity documents, currency notes and other such items which we have no control over, details of which will be addressed in another video. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri reported, The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever among you sees an evil, let him change it with his hands. If he cannot do so, then with his tongue. If he cannot do so, then with his heart, which is the weakest level of faith. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jibreel came to me and said, Indeed, I had come to you last night, and nothing prevented me from entering upon you at the house you were in, except that there were images of men at the door of the house, and there was a curtain screen with images on it, and there was a dog in the house. So go and sever the head of the image that is at the door, so that it will become like a tree stump, and go and cut the screen 
and make two throw cushions to be sat upon and go and expel the dog. So the Messenger of Allah وسلم, did so and the dog was a puppy belonging to Al Hussein or Al Hassan which was under his belongings so he ordered him to expel it. In another hadith it is mentioned Ibn Abbas continued if you are obliged to pursue your art depict the things which do not have souls such as trees. They say the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he doesn't exist. But I assure you, he is there. The devil is in the detail you don't discern. The symbols of kufr are everywhere in the modern world, signed by your eternal enemy. What does Sulaiman have to do with these lies that the disbelievers have accused him of in this accursed book? Sulaiman did not disbelieve, rather the devils disbelieved. What does Dawood have to do with the hexagon associated with him in many amulets and symbols? What does Isa have to do with the cross? What does the hand of Fatima have to do with Islam or Fatima radiallahu anha? What does the Nazar amulet have to do with protection? It can't even protect itself. What does the Mahdi have to do with the well of Jamkaran? Those who refuse the Rawafid venerate to the Mahdi to grant their wishes likening him to Santa Claus by writing him letters and throwing it in a disheveled well. When the Mahdi himself is only a slave of Allah and all power belongs to Allah alone. Now get up and get to work. Assalamu alaikum.